Well, thanks very much for having us today. I, I grew up um, watching a TV show that ran for five years and had such incredible popularity that the son of the original creator is now trying to reboot it in 2021. And we're talking about the Brady Bunch. If you just uh, go to the next slide here, there they are, the original cast. I have a confession. As a 12-year-old boy, I was besotted with Marcia, the eldest uh, daughter. I had uh, posters up in my bedroom adorning the wall there of her. Um, the, the Brady Bunch is the last of the idealistic sitcoms that um, Hollywood produced. And uh, if you know the theme song, it's all about a lovely lady who is bringing up three very lovely girls and it's about a man called Brady who had four men living all together all alone till the one day when the lady met the fellow and they knew it was more than a hunch. So uh, you can probably sing along. But what's interesting is that uh, as I reflect on the 117 episodes, uh, <laughs> none of the kids ever spun out at all. There was... I don't think we ever touched on the theme of addiction, um, mental health. Um, there were no affairs. In fact, um, Mr. and Mrs. Brady were widowed. They weren't divorcees. Um, and in fact, in the whole of those 117 episodes, there wasn't one rainy day. And that was deliberate because the weather was going to mirror the perfect atmosphere of this successfully blended LA family. And uh, it's the last vestige of that idealistic American family. It's life as it should be. And when you open up Job chapter 1, those first five verses, there's your popular image of the Old Testament faith. It's the godly version of the Brady Bunch. And in Proverbs, here's the recipe for this godly family. It says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with new wine. So the formula goes something like this. You recognise God and he'll bless you throughout your life. And uh, blessings are the reward of giving God his rightful place. And Job nailed that formula to a T. He had 7,000 sheep, it says in verses 2 and 3 there, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His godliness is unquestionable. I mean, he even makes sure that his family are covered. He, he has little sacrifices for his family just to make sure in case they've unwittingly or he doesn't know that they've done something wrong. He's a model of a godly person in a well-run universe. He's a very attractive character. Um, in these opening verses. His lifestyle is... And the wisdom that Job possesses is not what to look for in a donkey or, you know, how to get a servant to do what you want them to do or how to bring up your kids or how to arrange an investment portfolio. Wisdom for him is a healthy respect of who God is in this world. God is central to his life and wisdom for him is not brains, it's actually a posture that lets God be God. And Job's life is punctuated by order because of all this. It fits perfectly with the idea of God controlling his world, ruling justly. And that picture is set up of the godly life only to demolish it for the rest of the book. That's the very unsettling thing about this. It's shattering. Um, Leo Tolstoy, apparently, when he was nine years old, was convinced that God would help him to fly. So he dove headfirst out of a three-storey building. And it was his first major crisis of faith, I suspect. Fortunately, he did survive, and he went on to write War and Peace. But not all Christians land so comfortably. Uh, think for a moment, could your life sustain a Job-like moment? It hinges really on what your expectations are of Christian life and life generally. So I grew up in Melbourne. I, I, I've been sanitised and I've come to you 23 years after that. I've been here, so, you know, I've crossed, crossed the border a long time ago. But I expected when I lived in Melbourne, when it came to, you know, conducting my life, 
I'd go outside and it would be a grey day or a rainy day. You think, oh, well, just keep going, you know. It'll get sunny someday. And then one day the sun would come out and you go, that's amazing. Everybody would be greeting each other and saying, isn't it a wonderful day? We really treasured it because the sunny days were very, very far and few between. When I moved to South Australia, even in winter, you could have sunny days here, blue skies. It was phenomenal. In fact, the predominant weather pattern is really sunny days with the occasional grey day um, that mucks things up. So it's what I call a grey sky outlook or a blue sky outlook. And I think, do you have a Melbourne weather pattern or a Adelaide weather pattern when it comes to the way the world should work for you with your faith? Whatever it is, how does it stand up under a sudden reversal like the one that we see in Job? The tremendous shock comes in the Christian life um, sometimes that it's not like a yellow brick road. You know, the signposts aren't always there um, to avoid the pitfalls. And life gets very messy and suffering comes into our world with no logical reason. And for many of you sitting here, you've had that happen to you. And you know what it's like. You know the gap between what you think life should have been like and how it's actually turned out at points. And our hearts scream at that point and say, it shouldn't be like this. Why is it like this? It's the cry of a frustrated faith. Do you know one thing, first things kids learn to say to you, I think, um, your kids, is why? It's so unfair. It's not fair. And I learnt very early from a, a wise person to say back to my kids, you're right, it isn't fair. Life isn't fair, actually. And this is going to go on and on. That's the reality. So Job asks us, asks us three disturbing um, and unsettling questions. They're daring. Is God a briber? Um, secondly, is God in control? And thirdly, what sort of a God have we come to trust in? So is God a briber? Is he in control? If he is in control, what sort of a God is he? So let's go now to scene two, which is Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. And it's mirrored in chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. But this is now, we're in an enormous palace. It's a courtroom. Um, there's a king on a throne. There's servants coming and going. And in this picture, the accuser enters stage right and he presents himself to God. And that's his duty. He's required to do it. It's not because he's just sauntered up there. And he is given in verse 7 of chapter 1, permission to speak. Now, Mr. Satan, a time for a report. What have you been up to? Oh, you know, doing sort of stuff to and fro across the world, you know, my usual sort of, you know, mischief. Oh, um, okay. Uh, have you seen my uh, servant Job down there by any chance? So God points it out. What do you make of him? And this is the key to why Job's about to suffer, isn't it? Because he's being pointed out <laughs> what an exceptionally good man he is. It's because he fears God that the challenge is going to take place. Now, that's what uh, God highlights to the accuser. Faith, actually. Faith actually sometimes causes our problems, not uh, gets rid of them. And the accuser's reply is wickedly clever. He says, yeah, but does Job fear you for nothing? You know, think about it. It's a slur on Job's char character at this point. The only reason that Job fears you is because he sponges off you. Um, it's a little bit like in The Sound of Music, if you remember uh, Uncle Max. Uncle Max hangs around with rich Austrians. And then at one point in the movie he says, I, uh, I love rich people. I love the way they live. I love the way I live when I'm with them. And that's what Satan is accusing uh, Job of. Job is a user. He loves the way he lives when he's around God. Um, that's the only reason he's there. Even more subtly, it's actually a dig at God. It's saying that God is a briber. Verses 10 and 11. Have you, have you not put a hedge around him? Have you not made his household and everything he has? Um, you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks are spread out throughout the land. Haven't you? And the accuser is suggesting 
The same dynamic sometimes that occurs with desperate parents when they separate and they want to keep in with their kids and they just buy them stuff. They just buy them toys and they buy that devotion from them. You've smothered him with blessings, Satan says. The relationship will evaporate. If you turn that tap off, he's not going to be with you much longer. Take away the toys and he'll curse you to your face. You see, your majesty, your world is completely ruined. There's not a true believer out there, really. They're just there because of what you give them. Shame, isn't it? He sneers. Very, very cunning and devious question because he's saying, is an unbought devotion or loyalty to God possible? And ask yourself that question. That's quite unsettling, isn't it? What are you in this for as a Christian? Oh, I'm a Christian because of all the things that God has given me. Well, I'm glad you're thankful, but is it because you've got a husband or a wife or a family and friends and you belong to a great Christian community and you have a good job and you live in a nice street and you have an, you're in a nice home? Be very, very wary of that Christian proposition that says or suggests that the main reason that you will honour God in your life is because of all the good things he'll give you in return. Christianity is not a place where you can hide from the hard things of life, where you can be protected and shielded from all the nasties. The accuser used that idea to suggest that God was a briber. So God is worth serving because he's God. He's the Lord. And in your own life, when things go wrong, what does your behaviour in response to things going wrong reveal? Particularly to people who are watching you who don't have faith. You know, is it just a spiritual version of winning lotto? I think people look at my life, who aren't Christians, like hawks when things go wrong, because I want to see whether it makes any difference. People need to see from us that an unbought devotion to God is possible. You may know the story of Horatio Spatford, who in 1871 lost everything in the Chicago fires. He was a businessman, and two years later... He was getting back on his feet and his family, uh, he took his family over to England for Christmas. And uh, Spafford himself was delayed, so the wife and the four daughters uh, headed off before him. And he was coming on a ship a few days later. The ship that the wife and the daughters were on collided with another vessel. And uh, the wife, Anna, got the girls onto the deck and knelt down and prayed that God would spare them. The ship sank in 12 minutes. 12 minutes it was gone. And then a sailor in a lifeboat spotted a woman clinging to some wreckage, and that was Anna, and she was still alive. And they took her to England, and then she telegrammed her husband from Wales. And she just said this, saved alone... What shall I do? She confided in a pastor at the time there that God gave her four daughters. They've been taken from her. Someday she will understand why. Now, in the meantime, Spafford had booked the next available vessel to get across uh, to England to be with his grieving wife. Four days into the journey, the captain of the ship takes him to the deck and says, that's where the ship went down. At that point, he writes the words to a famous hymn. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And what he is saying is, an unbought devotion to God is possible. Now, we get back to the picture in Job, and we see here, uh, we're back on earth, it's a normal day. And the oxen are, you know, doing their thing, and the donkeys are feeding, and the family is celebrating, and Nobody knows what's about to happen. It's, it's like we're in an Agatha Christie where we see the murder at the start. We see the murder. We know everything that's about to unfold. But only us, God, 
and the accuser are aware of that. Job isn't. And then, you know, bang, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys killed, all the servants that look after them. The lightning strikes and the sheep and goats are gone in that fire. The bandits come down from the mountains. They raid the 300 camels and kill all the servants. And then a tornado comes through the valley and it blows down the house where all the kids are. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to bear bad tidings to somebody, or if you've ever had to do that. It's, it's not a pleasant task. But these messages come rolling in like breakers, you know, like shore dumpers. And as fast as one has finished explaining, the next one is coming behind. And an ordered life is thrown into chaos. And what you begin to realise, the irony is, is that the chaos is just as ordered and carefully designed. And we watch Job's life go down the drain. All of his possessions, all of his kids, it says in chapter 2, verse 7, all his body. I don't know whether you've met people like this in life, but you know, you, you, you hear their story and you think, what else could happen to you in a year? It's like they're flypaper and they just attract tragedy and catastrophe to themselves. And we find a man here whose life is on the rubbish heap. I mean, literally, he has to leave and go outside the city to where they throw all the dung. And he sits down there and scrapes himself with broken terracotta to relieve some of these itching boils. And Job's wife, you know, she's a realist. She comes out and she says, for goodness sakes, just curse God. Get over with it. Put yourself out of the misery. So he goes from success to rock bottom, he goes from riches to rags. His successful life cascades and tumbles into ruin through no fault of his own. And what does he do? Well, he says, he says, he says his response to it in uh, verse 20 through to 22 there in chapter 1. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I don't think he sung this in a happy sort of Christian chorus. No one's blamed though. No bandits, no weatherman, no stupid servants, not even Satan is attributed to this. Job just believes that God is in control of his world. And he gives and he takes and he says there's no such thing as, you know, the bad guys winning one day and the good guys the next. For some Christians, they would have you believe that. They would have you believe that, that, that things are going wrong for you because you just didn't pray hard enough. If only you knew how to pray more about this, more fervently, you'd be able to stem Satan's activities back. But the, we don't live in a world where Satan has the upper hand one day and God grabs it back the next. That's not the sort of world that the Bible presents. It's not a dual kingdom where you've got Satan running his own little world and God running his. Go back to that courtroom scene and you'll see that. At every point, Satan can't move any more than God lets him. He's only got as much rope as God gives him to glorify God. Job doesn't do what Satan hopes for him to curse God. Our, there was an Auschwitz uh, survivor called um, Harold Kushner. He wrote a bestseller, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. You may have heard of it. But basically, it's, the premise of the book is that God is trying to do his best and it's not his fault if he can't eliminate suffering in the world. He is, after all, not in control of everything. Now, that's where some people who are deists, come down. You know, they say, oh, look, it's just, you know, God's wringing his hands and he's trying to do the best he can. But Job will not allow you to have a God like that. This is not a God who is simply a chess player reacting to other people's moves. We're never simply in the hands of the accuser or the cancer that racks our body. Or the investment portfolio that's fallen through. Or the government policies that are now going to be implemented. Or bad childhood memories. We're never at the mercy of those things. Always 
in the hands of God. Job knew that. So should we. To say God is sovereign is to say he is in charge of this world. And that is a tremendous reassurance to know that we're held by God. As Romans 8 said to us, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death, life, powers, principalities, things present, things to come. What, when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate said to him in that moment, you know, I've got your life in the balance here. You know, I could release you. I could, you know, send you to the crucifixion. And Jesus says, lightning response back to him, you would have no power unless it was given to you from above. You may lose things, control, and I may lose control, and other people around you may lose control, but God does not lose control. Never. Job passes Satan's test because his wisdom isn't based on being able to unravel what's happening. All these consistencies. It isn't reduced to how much stuff he has to prove that he's being blessed. Wisdom is holding on to God come hell or high water. And Job rejects what his wife is urging him to do, which is to, you know, walk away. If God is in control, I guess it raises one more disturbing question, and that is what sort of a God would allow this stuff to happen to us? Um, if you've asked that question, you know, why does he let good people... Um, go down the gurgler and, and actually help and prosper wicked people. Well, you're in good company because the Old Testament is littered with men and women of faith who ask that question. Jeremiah 12, why do the faithless seem to live at ease, Lord? Habakkuk 1, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Psalm 37, I've seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a luxuriant tree. Why the injustice, Lord? Everything demands that righteousness should be blessed and wickedness should be punished, a la Job 1, 1 to 5. So let's summarise the scenes of these first two chapters. Because the whole book is a dialogue that's opening up here. I don't know whether you realise this. It's a, it's a dialogue about the struggle of having real faith. And it's a can of worms. Um, when people ask the big questions, sometimes we respond with formula and theory... You know, in apologetics, when the Bible asks the big questions, it answers with particulars. It gives you a person going through a situation, a person who could be living now in the 21st century. And if you take up the challenge to read the book of Job, you'll trace the struggle of a human being who's holding on when everything else gets stripped away. He's holding on to God. Studying Job is like studying the world civilizations through all their wars. I mean, it's, it's not the only part of life, but, you know, most times when civilizations give you their history, they just tell you about the victories, not the, you know, the things that went wrong. But this is about what's going wrong. And if you find Job a laborious read, you're meant to. You know, uh, we, we used to attend second grab, you know, to get the message across. Here you've got 42 chapters that will suck you into a black hole and the advice of his friends will go on and on and on. It's like a washing machine that just keeps going around or the same ground being ploughed up and it just feels like it's going nowhere. So don't be tempted if you read this to just read the opening chapter and the closing chapter. You will never understand what's really happening here because the book mimics what happens in real life when you suffer. The suffering of Job has to be gone through. Not visited for a little cook's tour. Job never sees what we see. Have a look at this diagram. Um, if you just pop this up, and you'll have to click a couple of times until we get all the pictures. So it's divided into heaven and earth. And what we've covered, what we've moved around is from scene one, two, three, four, five, and you'll see that what we get is the heavenly perspective on what's going on here. 
But for Job, Job's only got underneath the line to work out what's happening to him. He remains in the dark. He doesn't know what's going on in heaven. He doesn't know about the wager. And the book is a rare peek into the keyhole of eternity for us. Um, Job uh, shows us supernatural activity that is normally hidden from view in the world. Very often, I think, disappointment with God emerges because we go through a Job-like circumstance. So if you go to the next slide, it's more like this for us. Um, and whether that's, you know, uh, the death of a child or a tragic accident or the loss and grief of someone, we, we, you know, we sit there, we ask why, why, why does God allow this to happen to me? And when tragedy, a tragedy strikes like that, we live in the shadows and we are totally unaware of what is happening in a heavenly realm, what is transpiring in an unseen world. And the drama that Job lives through replicates our lives. But what does he keep doing? Because he doesn't have the picture we have. What does he keep doing? He keeps talking to God. He will not close up shop. Um, he gets angry, if you read it. He gets very frustrated with God and with his friends. But he does not close up shop. He does not do what Satan wants. Sometimes, like Job, that's all you'll be left with. Um, as he says, he's left with his integrity. Stripped of everything else, we can realise, you know, it's God, God can do what he wants in this world. He takes, he gives. Now, that's real wisdom. And that's why this book is in the wisdom part of the Bible. Because it's teaching you how to live through suffering and giving you this example of job to look at a relationship with god that is completely honest and 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 out there even when you don't have a full picture so i appeal to you don't close up to god when you suffer if you're frustrated with him tell him circumstances of adversity may push you towards him not away from him the book of Job begins with not the human viewpoint, but God's viewpoint on what life is like. Is God a briber? Is he someone who's trying to buy your loyalty? Job says, absolutely not. Is God in control? Job says, always. You're never at the mercy of anything else or anyone else. And what sort of a God have you trusted in? Well, the sort of God that gives you the dignity to keep talking to his face expressing your struggle, the frustration. God, who won't leave you alone, he will not leave you alone. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to think through our own picture of Christian life at the moment and purge it and uh, renew it and purify it particularly our reasons for blessing and prosperity that we might enjoy. Help us to acknowledge you in prosperity and adversity by fearing you, which is wisdom. Amen.